All right. Uh, so we're about to start our session. We have uh, one more minute. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody, all of our panelists, welcome. Uh, and please understand this session is being recorded. So everything you say is recorded. <laughs> the official time starts so and uh, I hope there will have many more uh, guests coming in to the program all right anything before we start because oh somebody even the one person left us so we hope we'll bring more people back but we have 12 21 30 is right now so we'll give it a couple more minutes uh, before we'll see people joining and then we'll start yeah sure We'll call a pregnant silence. <laughs> How's the weather in Michigan? Is it good? Better, getting into spring. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So, uh, guys, one of the things we're going to do is as we're going to th walk through it, the conversation can take us into different places. So a part of the things, uh, obviously, you will talk as much as, but please pay attention. If I'm trying to get in, uh, just that's kind of a signal that, that we have to move on, all right? So, um, and that's one thing. All right, so uh, let's start our session. Uh, welcome everybody again. Uh, our session today, it is uh, obviously a very timely session. And um, we're talking about next Black Swan event. And obviously this is refers to COVID of last year. I, I think it's a Godzilla event, uh, not a Swan event that we just transpired. Um, and obviously it left a lot of marks uh, across the globe. Uh, but the key is what we have learned from it. How do we adjust for the next thing? And we know at some point the next Black Swan event uh, in whatever shape or form will come. And we have to be ready for it. So I welcome my panelists, uh, uh, great uh, human beings from all, uh, actually today is from United States. And I'm speaking from Kiev, Ukraine. Welcome everybody. And I want to start with introduction. Emma, I would love to start with you. Please introduce yourself. And what do you do? My pleasure. Uh, this is my third appearance in Harassis. I'm so excited. Uh, the topic of today is making the, building the trust in the world. And definitely this topic is dear to my heart. Uh, I'm based in New York City. I'm a management consultant, executive. I'm an angel investor, author, speaker, and a coach and a professor. I have more than 20 years of experience in uh, leadership across business and technology transformation, uh, mergers and acquisitions. As a former partner of Ernst & Young and managing director of Accenture, I have first-hand uh, experience in transformations with Fortune 500 companies. Currently, I'm running an accelerator in uh, Instale Ventures. It's called Instale Ventures in New York. Uh, and uh, the goal is to drive emerging technologies, innovation uh, through accelerating startups and taking them to market in the U.S., fundraising and supporting their growth. Our target is to have 10 unicorns. Uh, and definitely one of them could be this black swan that we're talking about. Uh, I've been uh, teaching throughout my career at NYU, at Columbia Business School. I'm also mentoring at Singularity University. I love everything about exponential growth. Again, something related to the black swan. Uh, I published a book on leadership because I truly believe that only technology is not sufficient enough to take our society to the future. So the responsibility and the leadership, seven ingredients that I highlight, and one of them, no surprise, is accountability and responsible leadership, something that I'm going to relate to the uh, Black Swan as well. Excited to be here um, and uh, more to come during the hour. Uh, Emma, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, all men on this call and the part of our panels have something to aspire to. So with that note, I will thank you and welcome to the panel uh, and uh, your contribution. Uh, so uh, now we'll go to our next guest. I believe he's in Michigan now. Vincat, please, uh, to you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um... Henry, absolutely from Michigan, just about breaking into spring. Uh, I'm a management professional, worked for about 25 years, a lot of it in South Asia, Japan, and Australia, to be very specific. And of course, a bulk of it is in India. Uh, I've always been in a space where I've been advising 
uh, organizations, leaderships, uh, managements about uh, business and strategies and so on and so forth. I share one common uh, space with Emma. I used to be in Accenture. I was a general manager for Accenture India, leading the strategy for the organization there. Uh, most recently, right now in Michigan, I have been advising uh, higher education institutions and uh, most of COVID, I have had the opportunity to see the discontinuity and disruption from the higher education space. And it was quite interesting how this space has responded because higher education institution is also the space which, which is designing and defining the minds for the future. And it's quite pertinent to observe how the higher education space has uh, grappled with this whole episode. Uh, looking forward to discussing more. Thank you very much and welcome to our esteemed panel. Now, to uh, Jarvis, to you, my friend, and uh, uh, please share with us your background and um, everything about yourself. In All right, no problem. Thank you, Henry. Um, so my name is Jarvis Chairman, based in London, UK. Good evening to everybody. Um, so um, so uh, uh, we are um, a company, you know, which specializes in um, global trade. So we supply uh, warehousing and, you know, company information and management um, to businesses all over the world. Um, so my, uh, my expertise is to provide, uh, you know, trade advice and um, company um, professional um, advice, you know, uh, between Europe and Asia. Um, so um, so we are, uh, I've been um, in the business over 10 years. Um, so before I joined the company, I've been working for some banks in Hong Kong in the UK, um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, London, to our call. And now back to a sunny Florida. Uh, <laughs> Alberto, it's to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Henry. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good night. Good morning. I don't know wherever in the world you're listening from. And my name is Alfredo Morales. I'm very happy to be here. I'm a researcher uh, in the area of complex systems. I've been working on understanding the complexity of social systems over the last, let's say, 10 years. I used to be in academia. I held a position at the New England Complex System Institute in Boston. And I'm still part uh, of the researchers at the MIT Media Lab. And my applications right now, we, we are in applying. I work in a company, a management company, actually. We, we provide software and consulting to for clients to reorganize the, their behavior. And the idea is to use the complexity of social systems and our understanding um, of their behavior such that we can yield positive results from those uh, complex interactions and the way people um, interact with one another, where most of the complexity um, arises from, rather than being endangered by complexity um, you know, and, and rather than being exposed to negative outcomes, how can we harness the, the, this uh, reality from companies, but also in general? I, I agree um, that the problem of the world, like Emma was saying, is not technological. It's a philosophical problem mainly, and it's our perceptions and paradigms of the world. They do have a basis on philosophy. They do have a basis on how we see the world. And we need to update that and change it because the world became too complex for our previous models. And that's, I think, the, the favor of this topic. So uh, thank you very much for the- yeah, Great, well, Alfredo, uh, thank you very much because you were last on this uh, circle. Uh, we're gonna start with you with the questions that we all wanna answer to and have a discussion on right away. So uh, to all of our listeners, please, you can type the questions right into the chat as we go along and we'll bring them up. So, Alfredo, very simple. Let's just summarize very quickly. What is that black swan, the definition of it, in your opinion? And there's a general understanding of it. And number two of the follow-up right away, what can we do to predict the future black swans? Right. So uh, there is no short answer to what a black swan is, but I'm going to try to summarize it as much as possible. We're talking about large-scale events, uh, things that are big, like uh, uh, impactful uh, and also unexpected things that people are not uh, considering when they are making their plans or planning their strategies. And they arise or they are very well described by a probability distribution called fat tail distributions in which the, let's say the appearance of these more extreme events 
uh, is more frequent than just what the Gaussian or the normal distribution under which we base most of our analysis um, can actually describe. And the thing is that when you have a fat tail distribution, moments like the average, and this is technical, but it, it really is the key, moment like the average and the things that you see daily that, that are fre frequent and common are not descriptive, really, of the nature of the phenomena that you're dealing with. And just think of diseases for a minute. If you take 1,000 people with AIDS onto the metro, uh, the software system in New York, and you take 1,000 people with Ebola onto the same system, one will have a very large probability to create a pandemic, the other one won't, because of the transmission uh, probabilities. So yes, but Alfredo, I want to I wanna stop you there, because one of the things, uh, as a non-academia, as myself, I would summarize the Black Swan event is something that is completely <laughs> by population at large that has a, a basically outsized impact on the population and a usually negative impact. Usually uh, impact, yes. But when we're talking about black swans, we're talking also about fragility because the event is the event. It's negative according to how you are exposed to it. And that is where the, the, the attention needs to also go. How can I prepare myself such that whatever happens in the future won't affect my plants negatively? So how would you now, let's, let's segue into it. So now this event happens. We know the future is coming. The future events will come. We don't know what they are. So in your opinion, how can we as companies prepare for the future events? Well, first of all, we need to change our paradigms, right? And we need to stop thinking of events as bad events. They're just events. What matters is our exposure and we need to learn how to, uh, you know, operate uh, under those principles. What I would say is the most important thing is to learn how to operate in uncertainty, under uncertainty, knowing that whatever it's expecting, it's something that uh, you are not, uh, that you don't know, you cannot uh, predict. And that goes to your question about predictability. It's impossible to predict when or what size the next event will, will have or will happen. That sort of fortune telling, but it's like, See how people deal with earthquakes, for instance. I don't need to know when the earthquake is going to happen. I can prepare my building such that when it happens, it resists. And that's the... Yeah, but I'm afraid the in this argument, uh, the example of earthquake, we know the earthquake is going to come at some point and we prepare for yeah. it. When we're talking about black swans events, we actually don't know what's going to come. This it was financial crisis or was uh, COVID now. So we don't know what's going to be. That's the challenge. Right. And I think what you are saying in your analysis is ability to adapt and being flexible are the key skill set that yeah. leaders need to have. Yes? So you need to follow certain principles in order to get there because nature already says it. Nature is full of Black Swan events. Nature is full of stuff. Yes. Life itself has been attacked. So what do they, they do? Or what does nature teach us to do? First, pre proactivity, right? Prepare for the wars. You don't need to know what is going to happen, but just like... Prepare for, like, identify your fragilities and your fragile points and prepare for the disruption of all of those things such that nothing like touch you unprepared. Second, create optionality, have diversity, have it, uh, different options, different, uh, like, and work on them already. It's not, you don't have to wait for the event in order to work for the, uh, on these okay. things. Okay. And okay. Then, finally, finally, is the managerial model that you have and your organization. Is your organization capable? of adapting and responding, or is your organization tied? That's precisely. Alfredo, this is a great segue to Emma, who's going to talk about technology and leadership and how that, as a predictive models, can help, but leaders still have to make decisions. And those decisions are not easy to make at times, especially now. So Alfredo's model, describing the ability to predict or prepare yourself as a company. So what do you think on the technology leadership side, Emma? Uh, well, as we know, uh, a lot of the businesses, uh, they wouldn't consider themselves as technology organizations, but they're given the digital economy and technologies and almost every process in our operations, in marketing, in a going global perspective. So to some extent, uh, all companies are related to technology. Going on from that perspective, then I would put more emphasis on boards, corporate boards. Up until now, they did not have 
that pressure on when something catastrophic happens, it goes back to, oh, it was unexpected. I think moving forward, the plan B or the plan A following plan B, uh, the situation is to put more emphasis, more critical responsibility on board. their value. And I think uh, it's very short-sighted. It doesn't look into all this complexity that may come in from a black swans. So the board members have to be thinking as leaders and also they have to take more responsibility of decisions they are making short-term, long-term, opening up their thinking. And I go with exactly what Alfredo is saying. We need to change the perspective and the risk factors so we need to open up to more positive black swans. It's not only negative. So when you put more and positive black swans, the industry that follows is venture capital, which so means what's that, more you know, money. Emma, describe positive black swan. Aha, uh -huh, beautiful. You know what? What is the best example of positive uh, black swan? Is Google. It created the, the upwards, it was an unlimited opportunity for, for the entire society. The, the BP the oil spill is negative one because it has negative consequences. But the black swans uh, just take away some, something very critical here. There are positive and negative black swans. All of the corporations, mainly they, when they put their, and I've done a lot of those projects, when they put their business continuity plans, it's always preparing for bad. I think we need to expand brilliant, that, brilliant. a cycle to say, how do we prepare for positive? Because positive has a upwards unlimited, but you actually can manage the downward. Right. So brilliant. Thank you, Emma. And this is exactly what I wanted to go to our next uh, speaker on the panel. And uh, Vincat is to you. Uh, the question is, obviously, we live in a very large ecosystem as a society. COVID has showed how we're all connected, irrespective of geographies, religion, ethnicity, etc. So now you are working, obviously, uh, one of the things that I think came very clearly to me is the issue of trust of how we as humans must trust each other in a difficult time. So speak to that. And what lessons can we take going forward as a society? Okay, that's a pretty tough question. And you're a tough guy. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. you know, it's, uh, at times, at times I, I, I wonder uh, when, 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 we, when we try to even attempt to create a system or create mechanisms or cushions in the system to respond to something like a black swan, at times I wonder, are we overestimating uh, a circumstance? I, I would like to step back and uh, go back to COVID itself. There were some things about COVID which uh, doesn't matter what might be the intent, they were still there. Uh, the, the location, the, the gravity, the geolocation of the source of COVID and the current source of a significant global supply chain was same. So there was probably... Yes. But that being said, if you... I mean, at the face of it, COVID looks like pretty disruptive and a lot has been done across countries to do uh, something to mitigate the problem. But it can all still be summarized into two or three steps. What did the world do? The world first paused. It just deferred activities. And in deferring those activities, somehow we had to maintain the essential services. For maintaining those essential services, we just realized that the global supply chain was totally imbalanced on several aspects, even something as simple as tissue paper or maybe a sanitizer. Yes. Yeah. And all that you did was you scampered around to make sure that imbalance was tactically responded to, not strategically, but tactically responded to. I'm not very sure this is still qualifies for a black swan of a higher magnitude. 
For example, let's say the whole of Europe goes is subjected to some sort of electromagnetic pulse and you completely are out of electrical supplies or electrical transmission systems. You may not even have mechanisms to respond. And I would love to see, I would like to see black swans scope and scale at that level where it inhibits and debilitates the response, the response mechanisms and the response abilities of human design systems. But Vinkat, it doesn't it come back to one thing and one thing only that mm -hmm. we as humanity, I mean, we, we started in China and then we basically start blaming China. Americans did in that case with the Trump administration, right? Instead of coming together and working together as countries. And yes, Chinese probably hit some of it uh, for a while. Also be afraid of PR. So my point being exactly what you have said, those things rely on trust between the governments and people, isn't it? And coordination of effort. Yes. In a, in a way, I would, I, would, I would connect back to what Emma said, that there's something positive that could potentially come out of black swans. Well, if you really look at some of the pivots that happen in, in businesses responding to the situation, uh, for example, the classic uh, offshoring services. Traditionally, you would like to bring everybody into this in the, into these buildings, and I connect back to my Accenture days. In fact, there were specific clients wherein you barricaded that particular office space and the floors so that other employees could not go in, and that was a level of secrecy or that was a level of access controls that you maintained. And those very same organizations and a host of other organizations shifted those very workstations to employees' residences and made sure the businesses run so that 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 while you still maintain that same code, business code, you, you, were, you were able to trust and transfer the operating model into a very different dispensation. So, well, yes. It, and did that trust develop overnight? I don't think so. You allowed that trust to prevail overnight because of the operating circumstance. Well, yeah. I would love to see this in reality. Trust prevail overnight. That's something that would be amazing. Thank you. The great, great answer uh, and great discussion. So now to our men in London, uh, Jarvis, a uh, critical thing, obviously, you're in the warehouse business, your logistics business. Yeah, that's right. COVID had uh, impacted logistics tremendously, showed a lot of weaknesses in uh, supply chain across the globe uh, mm -hmm. in so many different ways. So obviously, government has to play a critical role in that, not only distributing, using logistics system to distribute uh, vaccines now, uh, yeah. which also is we're struggling with, uh, and but also... Talk about the warehousing, the new technologies that exist that can be much smarter and more efficient in terms of information sharing and distribution of goods uh, for what we used to. All right. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you, Henry. Um, so um, before uh, before COVID struck, uh, you know, back in March 2020, uh, a lot of businesses, you know, um, you know, have been gradually shifting, um, you know, towards um, tech savvy, uh, you know, uh, factors, you know, within the economy. Say, for example, a lot of a lot of people, a lot, especially a lot of company directors, you know, uh, based in uh, Europe, you know, have decided to um, to move some of their services and uh, products online, just in a bit to save more uh, labor costs, uh, more uh, taxation. Um, um, uh, for example, um, so uh, when it comes to um, the rollout of the vaccine, um, especially nowadays, you know, um, uh, that has been actually accelerated um, throughout the globe, especially in the UK, um, uh, 15 million people have been vaccinated, um, you know, um, uh, throughout the country. Um, so largely because uh, the government plays a, a huge role in distributing uh, the vaccines um, to all the citizens across the country. Um, so um, so in, my po in my point of view, uh, the supply chain um, needs to be um, really um, uh, needs to be really coordinated uh, between uh, the medical agencies, the government agencies, you know, uh, the hospitals, you know, uh, the medical staff, you know, all, all of all all of whom, all of which, you know, uh, could play a huge role, um, you know, in, in the whole process. Um, so, um, uh, um, uh, so it, um, let me just come back to your question on technology. So, um, so uh, I think throughout uh, the COVID pandemic, a lot of 
businesses, you know, have suffered a lot economically and financially. But some of the um, some of the most important um, tech companies, you know, have actually benefit uh, benefited a lot um, from the global pandemic. Say, for example, uh, uh, business business uh, revenue growth, you know, uh, in uh, in Apple, Amazon, Tesla. Uh, uh, and other companies, you know, throughout the U.S. and Europe, you know, have uh, have up by more than fifty percent. You know, um, uh, sending the shares up by more than you know uh, one hundred or fifty percent uh, in the last year alone. Um, but but the ordinary um, citizens, you know, have suffered a lot. A lot of people, you know, have been laid off. You know, uh, by businesses all yeah, over the world. Jarvis, it's definitely a very difficult situation for many, many people. Yeah. And that uh, brings me, thank you very much for your answer. We'll come back to you. Alfred, it leads me to you, actually. It's a very uh, good point where I believe uh, your expertise can be very, very useful as a researcher. Obviously, uh, your researching behavior of societies uh, and in, how does it impact economics in a way and what can we do to change things? So my question to you is, on the, on the societal basis, this event that just happened, how, what can we do to transform ourselves in much more adaptable uh, humans as a society going forward uh, in the future? Well, I'm in my opinion that I think it's one of the major things that need to, to happen, and it's related with Venkat, um, what he was saying, and trust, you know what I mean? And, and the, 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 I was reading, and I recommend this amazing author called Elton John, uh, no, Elton John, no. Um, Elton Mayo, and he's from like back in the 21st, uh, 20th century at the beginning. He was describing how uh, you know modernity at the time, and they're easy to communicate with one another with the telegraph. You know, they were making communication easy, but people, because of living in cities and whatever, like in comparison with older times, people are not communicating with one another. People are lacking a lot of communication, and the social issue with living is very weak. I was reading that at the same time that the lockdown happened. And they said to everyone, just lock yourself in your house and don't talk to anybody. And it's like, that's the opposite that should happen right now. We should get in together in every building, knowing who's sick, who's not sick, who needs something, you know what I mean? And have collective action. But how can you have collective action if you don't have trust and if you don't have communication, which is the basis for all of these things? And I don't think that this lesson is either discussed, you know? I don't think they got that point. Because the, the actions is the opposite of what they're doing. I think we're going through a in Ukraine. There's a third lockdown right now announced as tomorrow, uh, and I think we're going through different uh, trials of how to work it. Uh, Emma, uh, uh, to you, the question now is uh, on the leadership, obviously, right? So we are now going through iterations of COVID and lockdowns. Uh, the leadership economy is completely unknown to majority of people today. Uh, nobody knows exactly how to predict the even near future. Forget about the longer term. So leadership is critical now uh, at all levels, from uh, local level municipalities all the way to the officials in the White House and the like. So, Emma, please speak to that. Uh, how critical is this for us and what should we do in that regard in terms of economies and uh, leadership for those economies? Sure. Uh, so uh, if we look into the uh, leadership side, I think I'm going to use the word uh, supplemental leadership. The change, all of them should concentrate with the positivity and open mind really taking all innovation, especially in the uh, scientific research, because there is a lot of upside there and the money is not lost. So the leadership there is open up the risk factors that are really now precise and very stiff to actually not letting corporations to, not to do certain things. Uh, it, uh, first of all, it takes longer because those are big corporations. So the leadership from the board side, like, like, I'm going to go back again. The mm -hmm. boards should have a uh, better understanding that their openness to the innovation, to the technology, uh, uh, positive impact versus negative, what they are really looking into right now is going to be a major shift 
something that governments cannot do because governments have to take care of military service, catastrophic insurances, and homeland security. Those three are always negative black swans, always. But okay. the corporations can do scientific research, venture capitalists, those are always positive. But Emma, as, you, as you said earlier, corporations are now driven by shareholder value. That's their mission, right? So that has to change before uh, the, what you're discussing can take place because if the corporation is aim is solely a profit, therefore they cannot contribute to society as much as they otherwise could, in my opinion. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're not wrong, but let's expand it because if they are thinking that only going after shareholder value is how they're going to grow, adding all this innovation and the scientific research, the upwards, because it's unlimited. And I'm going to bring a very simple example of Schwarzenegger movie when one of his movies, and I'm going blank with the name of actually, read it, uh, I read it a couple of months ago. Uh, there was an example of the uh, upside or upward uh, uh, open black swan idea where when he signed to play in that movie, nobody knew it was so uncertain how the public will respond. So he said, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I don't need money if the, uh, I don't, don't pay me yeah. anything if I'm, if I'm, it's going to fail. But it became phenomenal, successful movie. So was he made was it three twin? times more than he was, he was going to be paid. So this is what corporations need to well, master. But you're now talking about taking risk. I think I believe that movie was Twins. I also read that story that was Danny DeVito. Phenomenal movie. I love yes, that movie. Yes, yes, that's the one. That's the yes, one. Thank you. Yes. Uh, but uh, we, beyond the movies, we got to we going back. And now, uh, obviously, we're discussing government, corporate world, business, and society. So I want to use example where I am, and the reason I moved back to the native land of Ukraine is because I see Ukraine as a land of opportunity where 30 years of neglect, uh, but the infrastructure is still in place, allows using technology, and because there's a weak, corrupt government, judicial system non-existent, you're talking about blockchain now and those type of things, right? Uh, where 95% of real estate need to be demolished and rebuilt. We're talking about smart cities now. So I want you to start dreaming a little bit, Vincat, now. In Ukraine's case, can we build a new country with new type of governments with what I'm positioning as economy of trust in 10 years and how we would go about that? Because I spoke to Alfredo. I want him to do a whole research about what we're starting to do right now. Live research as we do it, at least attempting it. Please, uh, Vincat, please talk about it. You know, somewhere uh, in all our discussions and uh, whether here or elsewhere, there's this presumption that um, it would be those large structures which will come and solve our problems. So be it the government or the corporations. So we somehow believe that the most distilled and ultimate intelligence is going to lie with the governments and the corporations. I think somewhere we are, uh, we are submitting or we are, we, are, we are kind of letting go, surrendering our trust to those structures. Exactly. Bravo. I think I think it all needs to start at, at our individual levels. I think we need to trust ourselves. Somewhere the the society or the structures that we see around us are nothing but our own reflections. Uh, it's pretty easy to pass on the blame to something extraneous. So I could blame blame the government, but let's also understand that whether it doesn't matter whether it's a democratic system or a, whatever may be the system, the collective population out there in any 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 concentration whether this country or a nation or a globe or whatever that you may wish to see by by commissions or omissions we selected a way to pass on power to someone to make those decisions so it was all of us are you coming to the point where blockchain technology this is what we work in ukraine yes. now well, I, will, I, will connect, I will connect to blockchain now let's look at Please. blockchain in, in, a, in a layman's language you said, I'm not going to trust one person. And therefore, what is blockchain? Everybody can see. And as long as everyone can see, I'm going to trust it. In a way, I'm saying I'm not going to trust anyone. I want to bring two examples here. Yeah. First of all, I was in St. Paul School in New Hampshire once. I mm -hmm. was doing a coaching course. I used to love coaching soccer. Mm -hmm. And in that school, where grew a lot of presidents and many senators. There's no locks. Literally no locks anywhere. And I asked the janitor, I said, why there's no locks? Yeah. He goes, because we teach our students, if there's nothing to hide, there's no yeah. need for a lock. 
Yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah. I would, I would, I would, you know, as they say that we are all uh, creations of nature. And when we do not know how to solve an issue, let's look back at nature. Look at some of the very large migrations that happen every year. Do you see a leader where millions of birds migrate in a very systematic manner? There must be some intelligence which is more than the individual intelligence. It's collective, yet it starts at the individual. And it also stays with a certain degree of trust. I, I feel the benefit. reaffirm that I do not think as a human being, doesn't matter what may be my qualifications, what might be experience, I think I would not conduct that affront to assume that I have a solution to this issue. That being said, I do believe as an individual, doesn't matter in which capacity or operator or which part of institution I am, I think the best I can do right now is to step back and let us create a space for new interventions to come in. We do not have to discover those in interventions. We just need to make space for those interventions while believing that intelligence does re does reside in that individual. Uh, brilliant answer. Thank you. That's That was great. That was really, really good. Uh, the panel, you guys are doing phenomenal today. To me, the blockchain, and this is the way I pitch it uh, to folks who don't know the Right. So, uh, Jarvis, to you, right now, there's a lot of conversations around the world to create a distributed and flexible logistical system that are capable to handle any type of uh, uh, deliveries and any type of products. So what are your thoughts as a professional in that space of how to design this type of warehousing that allows for a flexible uh, flow of goods? All right, that's a very good question. I think I think on, on top of that question, I think one of the you know one of the basic elements is that uh, trust you know needs to be paramount you know in some ways you know especially um, when you do um, you know cross border um, trade and you uh, and you, and especially when you move your goods you know um, you know globally. Um, so say for example, um, so some of the data on your goods you know um, have. Um, have have to be shared, you know, from from one company or one individual to the other. But the thing is, you know, some um, some governments, you know, some companies, you know, have have taken unilateral, you know, action just over the course of COVID. Uh, say, for example, um, some governments in the world, you know, uh, they're not sharing, you know. The vaccines, you know, they have purchased or they have, you know, they have owned with other countries, you know, um, you know, uh, which don't have any vaccines at the moment. Um, so coming back to, to the question of trust. Um, so, um, trust is always paramount when, when it comes to, um, doing, uh, business globally. But the thing is, you know, um, um, how can you, uh, write trust into into international law, um, trust can be, you know, can be very um, hollow in some way, you know, from my point but of view. The question is, why do we have to write into law? The technology allows us to clearly see what happens in every step of the way now. The laws, and in my opinion, the laws, I think the government is going to get much smaller, irrespective of its U.S. government or Ukrainian government. Yeah. I believe that the, 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 the number of people in the governments will slow down. So, uh, Joe, there's a lot of discussions here, a lot of big ideas, and uh, it's coming from everybody, which is great. So what I, I always do towards the end, I want everybody to take two, you know, one and a half to two minutes max, because we're running out of time, and finish up with whatever you want audience around the world to know about your thoughts about future block, uh, Black Swans events and how to deal with them. We're going to start with the lady we started in the beginning of the show. Emma, it's your floor. Absolutely. So I, I really believe in this. I was watching in, a, in a, this space for a while. Uh, I have uh, very thought leaders in this space, and we actually agreed to this together. Uh, the perspective is uh, increased responsibility of corporate uh, corporations globally. Uh, at some point, even consortiums created by all of them, at least by industry uh, or by platform, so there is a collaboration and uh, giving each other 
uh, boost to believe in uh, positive black swans. Uh, technology is giving computer science, uh, the uh, scientific research is giving all of that great data and it's available. It's a, it's a matter of how to use it and how to give it opportunity. So my perspective is change the mindset, have the risk factors. I've been uh, in the risk uh, business for 10, 12 years. So yes, risk has to be managed, but at the same time, the opportunities have to be given the right perspective and the right territory. Emma, thank you so much. And it's all, we all got to hope for positive black swans in the future. Uh, Jarvis, back to you. Your minute and a half is uh, going, starting now. All right. You know, there are always opportunity, uh, opportunities and risks, you know, along the way. Uh, whenever it's a, it's a positive black swan or negative black swan, you know, some companies or individuals can always benefit from an event, you know, uh, regardless, you know, how other people are, are faring. Um, so in my point of view, you know, if we could just struck a really, you know, balance, you know, between, uh, opportunities and risks you know uh you know we we could always just find a way uh moving forward into the future okay alfredo thank you very much uh, i want to take this op last opportunity to say two things first to big corporations and governments uh, stop creating the problems of tomorrow with today's solutions okay <laughs> That's great. <laughs> like today's problems are yesterday's solutions stop creating fragility stop transferring the fragility of your decisions onto the rest of the population. And there is one very good principle there, which is called principle, a precautionary principle, precaution at scale. The larger the scale of your operations, the more cautious you need to be, because you don't know how the system will react to the things that you're adding to the system until they are there. And there's a lot of layers to understand the things that I'm saying. Adjacent possible, I believe, with ethics. Sorry? Adjacent possible, I believe, with COVID. Adjacent possible is one of those. And to the population at large, please educate yourselves in complexity. Open your eyes and see who's selling you fragility. Politicians and companies understand the harm that they're doing before it manifests. Because that's the problem of black swans. That the, the corporate the society creates the conditions for them to arise. Then they happen, they, they blame, blah, 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 but we don't understand that we are creating this thing over and over, oh, and we need to stop this. Great, uh, great. Uh, now to the philosopher of the panel, Vincat, it's up to you now, your minute and a half. I would just, I would add to what Alfredo said, fragility, be very cautious about fragility, but I would also add vulnerability. Anything that enhances your vulnerability quotient. I would, for example, take blockchain and say, you might distribute trust but you become so much more vulnerable because if next time an EMP happens and your systems go offline, you have your whole system wrecked. So it would be good to simplify life. So what you're the best and the most intelligent in the world need to be sure that fragility and vulnerability needs to be constantly decreased and therefore essentially put it another way, improve the resilience. And I feel the best way to do that would be follow nature, keep it simple. Thank you so much, and it's a very good uh, comment in the end. And I want to finish up, first of all, by thanking all of you for a great conversation. Uh, I believe uh, the key, what we discussed, to maybe have a little summary, uh, the key is always to the trust. We all agree on that. Uh, the key is not to add problems, uh, but rather simplify our life that is very connected now. Uh, the key to obviously to leadership and the corporate boards uh, to take responsibility beyond shareholder value uh, to the society. So this all are very clear messages. And not only I'm grateful to this conversation to all of you because it's, I love what I do. I've been with Horasis for many, many years now. Uh, and because I meet people like yourself and many, many others and learn from them. And I believe that's part of the trust building where we're able to say we can learn from somebody else and learn from their mistakes and learn from their successes. So I, uh, what we are doing in Ukraine, interesting enough or coincidentally enough, uh, we started this before COVID, by the way, uh, we are building an economy of trust. Uh, we actually, this is our attempt to do this in a, a country that is known for corruption today. And we believe we can achieve that within the next 10 years using the technologies. I want to welcome you all and all of our listeners to Ukraine in the near future as COVID allowed. Uh, and uh, before then, I hope we're going to see each other many, many times 
on the Zoom calls. So thank you so much. Great pleasure meeting you all. Great conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Again, guys, great job. That was good. Stop yeah, sleeping. It was a pleasure to interact with all of you. <laughs>